It's always tough to follow that. When you're me, it's always tough to follow anything when you're doing this. Uh, because I am not the pastor, and some of you probably were thinking since he was up there last week, probably Matt will be back. Well, surprise, surprise, here I am. But we continue to, to pray for Matt and Tammy, and we do pray that he, uh, for whatever reason, whether you uh, just don't like me being up here or whatever, that he'll be back here soon and filling this pulpit the way that God has called him to do. Did anybody notice? Guess what I did? Got me another new shirt. <laughs> How about that? That's two Sundays, in, uh, two Saturdays in a row. I was able to make the trip to Walmart on a Saturday night and buy me another polo. So I now have two polos that fit because all the rest of them, uh, as I said before, have shrunk. I just want you to know that if you, for whatever reason, it's too warm in here for you, in 54 years of living, I've never come across an air-conditioned vent that blows as hard as this one right here. <laughs> and if, if Michelle was still here, if you'd have seen her walk up here and talk to one of you guys, her hair went straight up in the air. It is really strong. So after the service, or during the service, if you get bored or something and want to come up here, uh, you, can, you can cool off up here. You can even chip in on the sermon if you want to. I have set various reminders on my phone throughout the week. Among them are to help me remember to do my devotional, to spend a little bit of time in prayer. Uh, I, in the early service, one of them vibrated, and I thought, I need to remember after the service to change those. So I, instead of snoozing them for one hour, I snoozed them for two, forgetting that we're still going to be in here two hours from then. So if you see me keep looking at my watch, part of it is because I want to get you to lunch on time, but the other thing is that everything's probably going to be vibrating here at about 20 minutes before we finish. Uh, so anyway, today is Pentecost Sunday, and I've always known about Pentecost Sunday, and usually when I have an opportunity, uh, which uh, isn't frequently, but I do occasionally get a chance to fill a pulpit somewhere, often I can go back and find a, a message uh, that I've preached before that I can kind of retool and kind of work. That way I've got an outline already built that I can kind of follow. When you're not a professional preacher, sometimes it can be tough to find the time to, 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 uh, to devote to preparing something, to speak, uh, to preach on a Sunday. Uh, I did not have a sermon on Pentecost, much to my chagrin. So what you're getting today, you're the first group to get it. So I don't know if, whether to say I'm sorry or you're welcome, but nevertheless, today is Pentecost Sunday, which we see often and have heard called the birthday of the, of the church, the New Testament church. Uh, it's the day that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, 120 of them, we know from Scripture, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bible and you'd like to open uh, to Acts chapter 2, that's where we're going to be today. We're not going to read the whole chapter. Uh, it's a great chapter to read, though, if you just want to really read some scripture and, and hear some stories about the early church and what they did and how they had the Holy Spirit come upon them and how they handled that. It's a wonderfully encouraging chapter of the Bible to read, as are all chapters, but this one is really, really exciting. Uh, so it's the birthday of the New Testament church. So we're going to read Acts 2. We're going to read 1 through 12. And then we're going to jump down to the bottom and we're going to read verses 41 through 47. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of our God in our own tongues. 
Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And if you're reading in the scripture, you'll see there, uh, probably if you've got a little heading, it says some thought they were drunk. So then Peter goes into a, a, a sermon, and first off, he says, we're not drunk. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. So you can fill in this afternoon if you want to read all that, but we'll jump down now. Verses 41 through 47, it says, Those who accepted his message, that being Peter that day, were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. May the Lord add his rich blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. So the second chapter of Acts, as we look at the early church on this Pentecost that was happening then that we mark now, Pentecost Sunday, what we're seeing is the Holy Spirit acting in a way that the Holy Spirit had not previously acted. If you go back into the Old Testament, you'll see as in when uh, Saul was anointed the king of Israel, Back in 1 Samuel chapter 10, the Holy Spirit often was visited upon people and came to them, but did not stay permanently. So you would usually see the Holy Spirit came to this person, and then at some point further down the line, the Holy Spirit then left. As a matter of fact, if you, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, it says this. It says, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, being Saul when he was anointed king of Israel. Only six chapters later, in 1 Samuel 16, Scripture tells us that the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And in the very next verse, it says, the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. So if you know that story, you know that, that Paul fell out of favor, uh, Saul fell out of favor with God, and he was disobedient, became selfish and arrogant and other things. And so the Holy Spirit left Saul and came to David. And there, there are many other instances in Scripture where we can see where the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit came to Gideon in the Old Testament, Samson and others to enable them in that moment to do God's will and to serve Israel and to serve God's purposes wherever they were in whatever circumstances they were in. So here on this day of Pentecost, all these 120 believers, this is about 10 days after Jesus had ascended back into heaven. And all these 120 of his followers were together in one place. It says a house in some translations. And I'm thinking, wow, that must be a big house. 120 folks all sitting in the living room, fighting over the remote maybe, not knowing what's going on, hanging around, knowing that the Holy Spirit was going to come because they had been told this, right? But they're all together, and they're all together in one place, and this amazing thing happened. In the form of something that looked like tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit filled each of those believers, and there in that moment was born the New Testament church, the birthday of the church. Isn't that exciting? And I know these folks, these, these uh, 120 folks, they had been following Jesus. They had been with him. They had seen him perform miracles. They would spent all their time with him. And I know they, they knew who he was, and I knew that they... I know that they knew that he was going to leave them with the Holy Spirit. But I still sometimes wonder if they truly realized that this new movement that they were about to be a part of, that the Holy Spirit was coming, not for a temporary period of time, but to stay with them, to not leave them again, if they realized or could even have an inkling at the impact they were going to have, they were going to alter the history of the world. We're here now because 120 people gathered together in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit indwelt them on that day and it swept across the world and here we are. Wow, the Holy Spirit, it's amazing. It's important to note, as I said before, that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit was not unexpected. Jesus had told his disciples that he would send the Holy Spirit to them. 
John 14, uh, verses 15 through 17 says this, If you love me, and this is Jesus talking to his disciples, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Remember that word, forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And also, so Jesus is telling them here, he's saying, hey, I'm going to leave, but I'm not leaving you by yourself. I'm not just bailing out on you to fend for yourself. I'm going to leave the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, to guide you, to help you, to help you accomplish what I want you to accomplish. And it's important also, it was, this was prophesied in the Old Testament. You can go back and, and uh, the prophet Isaiah and Joel prophesied about the coming of the Holy Spirit. So I would suppose that even though they knew they would be receiving the Holy Spirit, they, like us, were still astonished and amazed when it actually happened. And we're that way sometimes. We know God's character. We know what God is able to do. And yet we still often find ourselves surprised when he does what he does and amazed, not because he is worth being amazed at, right? So what did they do next? The 120 have received the Holy Spirit. And verses 2 through 4 of our text tells us that they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And if you watched uh, Brother Walter's video on YouTube uh, about this scripture this week, uh, you, I think he posted it yesterday. You can certainly watch it when you go home. He talks about the gift of tongues. We won't get into the gift of tongues, but I know that in this current context that we're talking about now, you had these Galileans, these 120 Galileans who did not speak these languages, suddenly able to speak languages that they did not previously know. They were able to speak in other languages so that the Jews from, quote, every nation under heaven is what scripture has. And they were gathered in Jerusalem and every one of them could understand what was being taught and preached in their own language. I know that those of us who grew up in church, sometimes we hear these stories and we believe them. We know that they're true. But sometimes I wonder if we just kind of forget how profound these things are and how profound that moment was that all these people could suddenly hear the gospel being proclaimed in their own languages, and they were amazed at it as well. How many of you can speak another language besides English? Anybody speak fluently? One. <laughs> yeah. It's hard enough learning English, isn't it? Yeah, I've seen comedians that talk about words that are spelled the same with one letter different, and, and they pronounce completely different. Can you imagine having to, I'm reminded of my, I said this in the early service, Miss Quinn, Ricky knows Miss Quinn, some of the rest of you may know Carla Quinn, she was a fantastic teacher at Hopeful when I was in school there, but she happened to be my Spanish teacher in eighth grade. She was a great teacher, I was not exactly a great Spanish student. I can't imagine how much work it takes. I got, here's what I remember from Spanish mostly, and this is certainly not an indictment on Miss Quinn. This is an indictment on Thad and his study habits. Uh, zapatos, anybody? Know what zapatos? Shoes, got shoes. I got uh, libro, which is a book. There are other, lots of other single words, but among them also was cabeza, and later I would be told, hey, uh, grande cabeza, you've got a big head. <laughs> I've got a big head. So those are the kind of things I learned. But as far as conversationally, I'd never be able to, to have a conversation with some. I can barely do it sometimes in English. And here the Holy Spirit has empowered these 120 disciples to do something amazing. And he has given them the gift of speaking another language to people who needed to hear it, who didn't speak their language. I bet they didn't even have to conjugate verbs if you took Spanish. Wow, that's one of the least fun things I've ever done in school. So they, what did they do? They immediately went out into the streets of Jerusalem where they began preaching the gospel of Christ. So now we'll jump down to verse 41. So Peter has gone through. Peter has preached. Peter has assured them we've not had too much wine. We, we've, we've simply been taken over by the Holy Spirit, and we're being obedient, and, and, and we're filled with the Spirit. And so, down in verse 41, it says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So Peter preaches this sermon. 
which you can read, and I trust you all will this afternoon, in verse, uh, between verses 12 and 41. And after Peter and the others had gone out into the streets and preached, 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000 people. That's almost half the population of our city here in Wetumpka. 3,000 people. Math, Spanish wasn't my thing. Math was less my thing. Maybe school just wasn't my thing. Th Gracie, thank you for making good grades and not being like your dad and being like your mom. <laughs> Study habits weren't my thing, but I do know this. They started with 120 that day. The Holy Spirit came, and by that afternoon, 3,000 new converts to Christianity had joined their number. You know what that is? That's 25 times more than they started with. Only the Holy Spirit can do things like that. Only the Holy Spirit can empower us to do things that we thought we would never be able to do. Among them, hear, speak other languages, and then see 3,000 people come to know Christ and join their group that day. You know how good it feels. I remember growing up in church, my dad was the pastor. He would always stand down front after the sermon, and I always remember he would hold his hands up like this, beckoning people to come. We'd sing probably just as I am or some other beautiful invitation hymn. And sometimes people would come. You grow up in a little country church and it doesn't always happen. It doesn't happen every Sunday and sometimes it doesn't happen for a while because you got the same people coming. They're already members of your church. But I remember how excited I used to get when somebody would join and I would go, ooh, my daddy preached a sermon and now somebody's joining the church. And then I would wonder if they had kids because often I was the only kid in the church. I was it. So I needed some friends and I would go, ooh, we need to get to know them. Maybe they got a pool. Maybe we can go swimming. Maybe they got people I can play with. But you know how exciting it is when you get to, to meet a new person and you see somebody come join our fellowship, whether it be from a, from a sister church somewhere and God has moved them here or perhaps they're making a first-time decision to follow Christ. That's exciting stuff. Imagine doing it 3,000 times in one day. We wouldn't beat the Baptist to lunch, I assure you of that, because <laughs> there'd be a whole lot of handshaking and neck-hugging going on down here, right? And that would be a good thing, and I think we would probably be okay with being, uh, letting the Baptist get to the restaurant before us. So the Holy Spirit moved, the apostles preached, people got saved, the church grew exponentially, and in verses 42 through 47, we're painted a beautiful picture of what the church looked like in those early days. Verses 42 and 43 says, say this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So the Holy Spirit earlier that day had come upon the 120 who then went out and preached. They saw 3,000 people come to faith in Christ, respond to their preaching. And so the Holy Spirit then came upon 3,000 more people. And at these 3,000 people as such, what did they want to do? Well, they wanted to learn more about Jesus, and what it meant to be a follower of him and how they could do that. They were excited and they wanted to learn, so they de devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to pray together. We just did that just a few minutes ago. Aren't you thankful for prayer? And aren't you thankful for corporate prayer? Corporate prayer is a wonderful thing. It's, it's, it's one thing to, to, to throw up a prayer, and, and we should do it, and we do it, and it's wonderful. But to be able to share your concerns with others who will pray with you, and you can know that when they leave or when we leave today, some of you, hopefully all of us are going to remember that some of the ones that Deanna mentioned, particularly Matt and Tammy. And we're not only going to pray for them here, we're going to pray when we're out there. And we're going to pray when we get together. Do you say a blessing when you eat at a restaurant with your family? Corporate prayer. It's wonderful. They wanted to pray together. We should want to pray together. They ate together. This is the second time in Acts chapter 2 that they talk about breaking bread together. Does that tell you whatever we do or don't do in the church in the south that looks like this early church, one thing we will do, right, is get together and eat. Will we not? There was a, uh, a, a gentleman named J.D. Thrasher who was our worship leader at Hopewell Riverside Baptist Church when my dad was pastored there way back uh, in the late 70s and 
and into the into the 80s. And JD, anytime we would have a uh, uh, dinner on the grounds, is what we used to call it historically. Well, then we discovered air conditioning, and we thought, let's build a fellowship hall and let's do it in there, so it won't have flies and it won't be so hot. So when we would have a uh, fellowship meal after church on a Sunday, JD, without fail, and I mean without fail, JD just uh, passed away, I think, in the last year or so. Good man, great family. He would always say this, and I've never forgotten it. Ain't no fellowship like table fellowship, right? That's good. Man, you, you, can, you can look at somebody and get excited when there's a big plate of fried chicken and green bean casserole in front of you. And we do that, and that's a good thing. It doesn't always have to look like this. This is not necessarily the fellowship that we always have to have. We're fellowshipping, but we can also go to a restaurant together and fellowship with like-minded people. And that's what they were doing here. So they, they obviously broke bread. They liked to eat together. They wanted to spend time together. Have you ever been to a church service where the Holy Spirit had moved so much. Back years ago when I was a kid and we used to do revivals, I, I've mentioned this before, we did, revival lasted five days. Like it was actually six, it would start on a Sunday and then it would go Monday through Friday and Monday through Friday, you'd, if you were the guest speaker or the preacher's family, you'd go to somebody different to their house and eat every night. And, and in those revival meetings, sometimes the spirit was so evident, people didn't want to leave. People wanted to stay. Have you ever been in a service like that where the Holy Spirit has moved and you just kind of want to hang out? You kind of don't want to go home? Because maybe you know when you go home, you know, you're going, somebody's going to have the TV on, or you're going to hear some bad news. They just wanted to, you just wanted to bask in that spirit in that moment. That's what's going on here. They wanted to spend time together. That's pretty much what's happening here. Verses 44 to 47 says this, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They had everything in common. They had been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They knew what the Holy Spirit was, was pushing them to do. They had heard the gospel preached. It was now their turn to go and preach the gospel. They, that was, they were single-minded of purpose. It's tough to focus sometimes in the world today, isn't it? even in the church. It's tough to focus, and there's lots of different reasons for that. But they had the common goal, and sometimes I feel... Gosh, sometimes you look at the church, not this church, not any specific church, but the church, the New Testament church worldwide, and you think, gosh, we're split and we're divided in a million different ways, more ways than we can even count. And sometimes we tend to focus on all those differences, and those differences are not insignificant. So don't hear me saying that. But what I am saying is sometimes we tend to maybe major on the minors, and we need to remember what our calling is and what the Holy Spirit is moving us to do, which is to share the gospel and to go back to, that, to those roots, so to speak, and seek to unify. Not anything unbiblical, but know the people, if they're on the same team as you are, that we should be single-minded of purpose, we should all have everything in common, and we should be about the work of spreading the gospel to a world that very much needs it these days. So... They had the common goal of sharing Christ and living for Him. And given that this is sometimes a, it's an un, increasingly unbelieving world, is it any wonder sometimes that people don't want to be a part of the church? Maybe we shouldn't be shocked by that. So we must submit to the absolute truth and the authority of God's Word, period. That's it. When we do that and we try to live our lives in front of everyone who we come into contact with, with a true biblical worldview, seeking nothing more or nothing less than to simply seek to be pleasing to our God, then we can have unity. So it says they also met the needs of the people in, our, in, uh, in their community through the giving of their time and resources, and that they continued to meet together every day. 
As I said a minute ago, we may not always have a church service like this where somebody stands up and we go through and we have a, a worship guide and we do those things, and that's certainly fantastic. And we may not always have that, but there are plenty, plenty of opportunities for you and I to get plugged into ministry at First, United, at First Methodist Church, right? There are plenty of things going on throughout the week that you can get plugged into. There, there are all kinds of ministries. All you have to do is look. And they continued to meet together daily. And it says that every day people were added to their number. So we need to continue to meet together every day. Aren't you glad? I know I am. Because during the worst of our response to the pandemic, when most of us weren't going to church, and there were people, we watched it on YouTube, or we had to, in some cases, local churches would have their pastor stand outside and they would pull up like an old drive-in movie. You remember the old drive-in movies? And they'd have a speaker out there, and that's what we did. You know what? Those things are good, and I'm glad that we have YouTube, and, I'm, and I know that it's a wonderful ministry for people who are homebound or sick or for whatever reason can't be here all the time. But if you can be here all the time, Every Sunday, there is no substitute for being in the house of the Lord with God's people. There is no substitute for that. There is no substitute for that. They did that in the early church. We should seek to do that today. So they continued to meet together every day. And because they were obedient to the teachings of Jesus and sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the scripture says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Man, isn't that a beautiful picture? Isn't that a beautiful picture? So people then and that church and that movement were leading people to Christ, who then led people to Christ, who then led more people to Christ, and so on and so forth. And every day there were new converts. And every day somebody was coming to know Christ. And every day somebody was joining their church and getting involved, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Because remember the difference in the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the New Testament Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to stay with us. So our church does a pretty good, in fact, we do a really good job at most of these things. We do prayer walks. Some of you have been a part of that back around Easter where we meet here and walk across and we pray in town and pray for different business owners and people. That's an opportunity for you to get involved. Various community service projects. I know, gosh, when Gigi and I first uh, started coming over here, uh, lots of you came to her school and, and did a lot of work, which thank you because that saved me from having to do some of that work. But nevertheless, you did that. And those are projects and community service things that we can do, and we do a very good job at that. All kind of ministry opportunities. We do a good job, I think, at loving and discipling the people God sends to us. Whether they look different, act different, have a background in church, don't have a background in church, we love them. We tell them about Christ. We tell them about Jesus. We tell them about what he did for us and how they can have peace and how, how they can have heaven on the other side of this life. And we do all these things, I believe, while acknowledging and accepting the absolute authority and truth of Scripture, which is absolutely, you do it without that and we're not doing a service to God. But as good as we are at those things, we can always do better. And I think the way that we can always do better is to do exactly what those 120 followers of Jesus did on that Pentecost Sunday so many years ago. And what did they do? But they surrendered their whole lives to Christ. They didn't say, I'm going to take this part of my life and I'm going to put it in a box and I'm going to sit it over here. This part over here, God, you can have that. You do whatever you want to. I'm going to hang on to this. They gave it all. They gave it all to the point that they literally gave it all, right? They gave their stuff. They were selling their belongings and giving their money to people who were in need and ministering to them. So, so, so they were making inroads, meeting people's needs, and then also sharing Jesus to meet their ultimate need, which is a Savior. And that's how we can get better at doing that. The Holy Spirit that came upon King Saul and David 
and Samson and Gideon and others in the Old Testament is the same one who came to stay permanently with those 120 followers is the same one who indwells you and I today as believers. It's exactly the same. Nothing last week we talked about where's God when bad things happen. God's where he's always been. He's on his throne. Is the Holy Spirit Spirit different then than it is now? Absolutely not. That's a lot of power that you and I have. That's an awful lot of power that you and I have. And I hope that we can tap into that and accept that and embrace that. And I pray that we'll do that today and we'll see the opportunities that he'll give us today to let the Holy Spirit guide us and that we'll do that in the future and uh, both individually and as a local body of believers here at First Methodist. And we can become an even more faithful, true representation of that first church. So happy Pentecost, happy birthday to the church. Thank you for being here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. And today, especially of all days, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you didn't leave us here to walk this world haphazardly and just try to make our way through. We thank you that you left us the Holy Spirit to give us truth, to give us guidance, to minister to us, to encourage us so that we can do those things for others. And again, Father, I pray that on this day, you'll help this group of gathered believers to embrace your Holy Spirit and to be obedient to your Holy Spirit as we leave here and go out into the world, that we'll be New Testament, Bible-believing, Great Commission Christians today and every day. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.